So I mentioned, however, that uh, in terms of de Broglie's work, this was Nobel Prize worthy, absolutely, but it was also his PhD thesis. So we can think about what would happen if we're on his thesis defense, we're on his thesis committee. We would need to think of some pretty uh, mean, hard, nasty questions to be asking de Broglie about this theory. That's what happens when you defend your thesis. This is necessary. It's hard to find holes in a Nobel Prize worthy idea, but let's just try maybe one of the basic questions they could ask. And they could say, all right, de Broglie, so you say that all matter, absolutely all matter, has wave-like behavior. Why is it that we're never observing this? You know, for example, why is it the table doesn't diffract as we bring it through the door? Why don't we see the influence of the wave-like behavior on everyday matter? So it turns out that uh, he could have picked anything to explain this and hopefully done out the calculation, and we'll do this ourselves. And uh, the example we'll pick is considering, for example, a Matsuzaka fastball. So uh, many of you are new to the Boston area. Now I still realize, and I want to let you know it's not required that you be a Red Sox fan to be at MIT. Um, we do encourage it, however, <laughs> and um, in general, I find you don't have to give up that old team. You know, you can keep your old team, even if it's teams I won't name. Just keep them to the side. And you can join on to the Red Sox nation on top of that. And part of being a good Red Sox fan is knowing the statistics of your team. For example, if we're talking about a pitcher like Matsuzaka, we might want to know the speed of his average fastball. We might want to know his ERA. If you're really into it and you're at MIT, maybe you want to know the wavelength of these average uh, fastballs. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, so if we're trying to figure out the wavelength of a Matsuzaka fastball, we need to consider the velocity first, which is 42 miles per hour. We don't usually do our uh, chemistry calculations in miles per hour, so let's switch that to uh, 42 meters per second. Sorry, it's 94 miles per hour. And we can use the de Broglie relationship, that wavelength should be equal to h over mass times volume. And uh, we can put up here Planck's constant. And I want to make note that instead of writing joules per second, I actually wrote out what a joule is. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Occasionally, you'll find you need to cancel out units because, of course, you're always doing unit analysis as you solve your problems. And sometimes you'll need to convert joules to kilogram meters squared per second squared. Uh, we divide that by the mass, so 0.12 kilograms. That's the mass of a regulation baseball for the major leagues. And uh, the velocity of the baseball is 42 meters per second. So we can cross out our units doing our unit analysis. The seconds cross out. The kilograms cross out. Uh, one of the meters crosses out from the top. So we're left with an answer in meters. It's always good when we're looking for a wavelength that our answer is in a unit of length. That's a good sign already. And what we find out is the wavelength of a Matsuzaka fastball is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 31 meters. So this is really small. This is undetectably small. And especially when we consider it, what tends to be important is the size of the wavelength in relationship to its environment. So 1.1 times 10 to the negative 31 meters is not, in fact, a significant number when we're comparing it, for example, to the length of a ball or the size of the baseball field. Um, so that would probably be de Broglie's answer for why, in fact, we're not observing uh, the wavelength behavior of material on a day-to-day -day, uh, -day life. So uh, that's for Matsuzaka. You know, and even if you don't memorize all the wavelengths for all the pictures, I would expect, whether you're a Red Sox fan or not, you to be able to look at a list of different pitchers and their average velocity for their fastball and tell me who has the longest or the shortest wavelength. You should all be able to know that relationship. So why don't we go to a clicker question here and uh, see if you can tell us this. So we have uh, four different pitchers we're showing here. They all have different strengths. It's not always how fast you throw the fastball. Sometimes it's, it's uh, your, your different styles or the different ways that you decide when to throw what. So first we have Matsuzaka at 94 miles per hour. Um, so click one if you think that he's going to have the longest wavelength. Uh, Tim Wakefield on the DL right now throws a lot slower because he has that tricky knuckleball. He doesn't need to throw as fast. 
Uh, then we have Beckett, who can get up to 96, just on a regular old day. And uh, Timlin, who is about 91 miles per hour, one of our relievers. So why don't you take 10 seconds to do that? If you can't decide, uh, Timlin is my favorite ever, so that would be a, a good backup choice if you uh, forgot the relationship between wavelength and uh, oops, uh, between wavelength and the relationship between speed. It looks like, in fact, people did not forget that relationship, and only one percent of you humored me. Uh, so. <laughs> Let's see what the correct answer is, and it is, in fact, Wakefield, right, because there's an inverse relationship between how fast a particle is going and what its wavelength is. Uh, so wavelength, in terms of wavelength, uh, Wakefield has the largest wavelength, uh, but in terms of being significant, we're still not even close. Uh, it's still undetectably small.